one of the reasons we're interested in this question of how much should we have in the way of long-term contracts and how much should we have in the way of shorter-term trading uh, has to do with how we establish the price. Remember in the scarcity price story, we're keenly interested that the current price of electricity match the marginal cost of the, high, of the highest cost generation asset that we bring, uh, that we turn on to meet the electricity demand. And that scarcity signal, that price signal, tells us about the scarcity of electricity to society. And in return signals back to the rest of the economy, how much more do we want to invest in these resources? How much do we want to invest in, in infrastructure? So the question for us is, how much good price information do purchase power, agree power purchase agreements provide to us? And the answer is unclear. Um, the, the process for negotiating power purchase agreements uh, is uh, you have uh, single large transactions that are made in uh, the context of a bilateral contract between a buyer and a seller. Uh, the contracting process tends not to provide clear scarcity price signals to us. So a long-term contract has many features in it and because there are so many features in this long-term contract, we're not getting a clear signal from power purchase agreement contracting about the true scarcity of providing electricity, A, over the short run variations, but even in the long run because we can't separate out the various terms of the contract. The contracts are not uniform. They're bundles of different attributes. Uh, the scope of the request for proposals that, uh, that DISCOMs might make for new generating facilities uh, might be limited. We need a certain kind of new power. We need a certain kind of new generation facility. If that's what the request for proposals is like, then the only signal you're going to get is about the cost of generating those kind of units. We don't get a price signal that um, indicates how often those units are used and uh, how long they're, they're used for. Um, the other thing about negotiating these bilateral power purchase agreements is the transaction may not be at arm's length. You may have parties who uh, are uh, part of the same state government. You may have parties that are routinely transacting with each other uh, or have a continuing relationship and so the, the bundle of PPA prices don't actually represent the pure scarcity, the pure uh, levelized cost of energy for this transaction because there's a longer term relationship at stake. Um, the, the term of the contract um, reflects the party's relative assessments of long-term risks, which is another thing that enters into the contract. So if what we're looking for is a signal of long-term scarcity of electricity, we have all these signals blended in together and it's hard to tell what we, what we can determine from this uh, that tells us what sort of other facilities we might need to build. Um, the other one final thing that affects power purchase agreements that may um, prevent them from offering up really good price signals, scarcity signals for us, is that the existing tariffs faced by the DISCOM are going to help determine the terms of the contract. So the tariffs themselves are not set in any sort of competitive market, and yet they're going to be an important factor determining the um, DISCOM's willingness to pay for a given power purchase agreement. So the contracting process for PPAs is complex, 
negotiations over bundled assets between two parties, and we simply don't have any strong reason to believe that what we can observe about the terms of this PPA truly reflect the long-run scarcity of assets to society and how they should be used in um, marginal cost merit ordered uh, dispatch of assets. <clears throat> in some cases, discoms are the only buyers, so there's no uh, competitive market here to discipline the price and make it give us a true scarcity signal. Another thing we want to consider as we're thinking about the price signal we get from PPA terms is that that there are a bundle of different attributes in terms of the payments that are made. So PPA terms will include a capacity payment, which is a payment sufficient to ensure that the capacity is made available to the market. So a capacity payment to the generator, uh, a stream of energy payments to the generator, and then deviation terms. So the deviation terms are terms about what payments will be made should one party or the other not meet the terms of their agreement. Uh, as as initially laid out. So the capacity payment is going to be uh, uh, a payment that's made that makes up for uh, any difference between what the energy payments would induce a generator to do and what the generator has to make to be willing to, to um, build the asset. So for example, as we talked about earlier, if you have a limit on the price that markets can actually um, uh, can actually reach in a given level of scarcity, if you have a limit on the price that can actually occur, then PPA terms are going to have to have a capacity payment in addition to the energy payments or the generator wouldn't be willing to build the asset because they're not making enough of those scarcity rents. And so you'll have an energy payment, often supplemented by a capacity payment, and then deviation terms. So the question is, how do you read these payments to give you a sense of uh, marginal cost of generation in a supply stack? And the answer is it's really not possible to read these things from, uh, from a standard power purchase agreement. So we conclude that a power purchase agreement doesn't really provide us with the instantaneous signals about scarcity that we need, A, to determine that we have the right assets being run at a given time, but B, if we believe the scarcity pricing story, PPAs aren't going to send the set of signals we need back through the economy to, to um, determine precisely which assets need to be built and where entrepreneurs should concentrate their interest if they expect to make, uh, make profits in this market.